The next conversation is with European Tour player Paul Dunn. Paul has had a great career so far, from leading the Open as an amateur, winning the East of Ireland, representing Ireland, getting his European Tour card and fending off Rory McIlroy to win the British Masters. Paul shows and provides great insight into how he practices to get the best out of his game so he can perform at the highest level. Check it out. Personally, the, the general consensus is that like golf is probably like one third technical. Uh, I'd love to know your opinion on that. I know you're quite technical, are you? Um, I find it hard to put a number on it because I'd say it would depend on like depend on where you are at technically at the time, you know. Because like yeah. sometimes the answer is technical and sometimes it's not. Like generally it's not. But I would say that people do go down a rabbit hole of they go way too far down the technical route. And it very rarely produces good results when you go too far down that route. And nobody goes down a, a road that's that's too competitive, you know, or too game oriented. So um I'd say like if you were looking at which way you want to you want to veer if you're going to be extreme either direction it'll be towards the competitive side and get away from technical stuff but but having said that sometimes you're at a tournament and like it's one little technical turn and that's that's what's going to do it for you because every all the rest of the competitiveness and the short game and the stuff can be really sharp you're just waiting for that one little spark to click so i would say it would depend on kind of where you're at but generally like when you're at the professional level everyone's tech is good enough to get them around the golf course you know so the other side is more important and is that what veers towards developing winners uh you know you probably had a competitive edge from a very young age you know you were great great footballer great golf player obviously great golfer great tennis as well was it tennis player as well i played tennis yeah but chase i was young <laughs> i was like six <laughs> fair enough yeah well, you developed a competitive edge quite young, which a lot of a lot of players don't. And is that the difference that sets lads out from winning and losing? Yeah, I don't know. I think like the interesting thing about golf is you tend to see winners are winners, you know, mm. and they've kind of been born and bred like that. Like if you look at someone like Speed, you know, he seems to have been like that his whole life, and it's not like he's not like he's the best player that's ever going to play. You know, but when he has a chance, everyone watching knows that he's going to be extremely hard to beat. You know, when he's on. So, I think it's uh, it's instilled in someone. You know, if mm. they're if they're gonna if they do it or not. And I think just because you're a winner doesn't mean you're going to win. You know, but you're yeah. going to give yourself the best chance, and you're going to do everything you can. You're not going to shy away from, you know, a challenge. That's one thing Podrick always said to me. He said, he said he's not afraid to put his neck on the line. You know. Uh, mm -hmm. And he said it'll get chopped off more than a dozen. But he said he'd rather get to put his neck on the line and get it chopped off than to not put his neck on the line ever. So yeah. I think it depends on your perspective with it. You know, if if you're someone that embraces that kind of chaos, then you're going to do better over the long run. But some people shy away from it by their nature, you know, and that's just the way the way they are. And then that becomes something that they have to overcome. Mm. Very hard to overcome later in life, though. Would you not say? You know, I love I love the com competitive uh, environment of anything. Um, it's probably pretty stupid. Like I, my friend's a personal trainer, great runner, great everything, and I still try and lift heavier weights than him. I still still try and run faster than him. I still try compete with him every chance I get. Uh, in golf, the same thing. You know, I'd I've no problem playing someone for money in any way. Just I get hammered if he's so much better than me. But the competitive edge. Is something that I enjoy doing, and I don't know where it came from, but a lot of guys don't enjoy that edge. And but why is that? Because that's surely the edge needed to get to the next level. Yeah, I don't know. You'd have to ask them. But I, it, it is something that can be overcome, though. You know, it's like everything. The first step is is realizing that you need to overcome it. You know, um, and yeah. then like it's not it's not a hard thing to to guess. It just takes time. You know, it just takes time and practicing in uncomfortable situations taking taking bets like you said you don't think you can win and try and win them um mm -hmm. someone told me the best the best way to practice for tournament golf or the best way to replicate it is to play for more money than you have yeah. and that's Very kind of true that. yeah that's kind of true because when i was in college we used to do that like you know you'd only have 20 quid left in your for your food for the your couple of days until your next check comes in and you'd uh you'd be playing $5 a hole, you know, so you knew you'd have to kind of have your 
stuff together. So, and then obviously it becomes a little bit like it's just not something you should do. <laughs> you know, you shouldn't play for more money than you have. It gets you down a a really bad road. But but that's the kind of stuff that'll simulate a competitive environment in a tournament because it'll bring that fear in. You know, that fear of failure, and that's something everybody has, and just some people deal with it much better than others do. Yeah, um, would you revert that back to when you were a junior coming forward? Like, what what separated you from the rest of the guys? I know your work workload or work et- work ethic was far more superior. Playing nine holes of golf, coming and playing a football match, maybe a game match, and then going and playing another nine. You know, would you put that down to your workload or the fear of failure? No, I'd say that was just down to love of the game. You know, I think when I was younger, I loved golf more than everyone else that was around the club and stuff you know like I had a lot of friends that played it and really enjoyed it but like I loved playing it and then when I got home all I did was think about it and then I'd wake up the next morning with something in my head that I wanted to go and try you know and then I'd do it all day and then it was just that on repeat for years so like I wouldn't say it didn't feel like a workload you know because you're only 12 or 13 it's just that's what you want to do and um, I, I also don't think it would like obviously the other sports help. I was always competitive, but you're from a competitive family. Like my dad was competitive as well. Um, like he'd never let you in as a kid. If you if you beat dad or something, you knew you beat him. You know that sort of way. Yeah. Um, so and I could see I could see I was edging towards getting better than him. So that was another kind of drive. But now when you're that age, like I just loved playing golf. You know, and it's it's what I wanted to do. I loved it more than other people. You know, I was trying to drag them up the course, especially when you got to the 14, 15 age and people, you know, start other interests come up in life. Like people start chasing women and having a few drinks. Um, Gary, never, Gary. At, at that, yeah, at that age, it was never an interest for me, or maybe a little bit later. <laughs> but <Yeah. laughs> uh, then that's when I started to see people kind of filter out and I was still doing it. And then I got thrown in the national system <clears throat> So you get thrown in with better players and you get exposure to people that are better than you. And then you've kind of, kind of got a ladder you can climb up. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, 100%. Um, so you um, you shot about the 61. 61 you shot against um, in the British Masters, wasn't it, on the Sunday? Yeah, yeah. Now, I, I watched the game of golf. It was Obviously, it was unbelievable. But reverting back to what you said there, you went onto the course to... You know, you're thinking about something as a junior. You wanted to try the next day. I know. I'm sure you ref Carl's head about how do I hit this? How do I hook it around the trees or whatever it may be? But do you revert back to sort of those sort of practice sessions when you're in that scenario of shooting a good score? You know, you're just playing golf because you enjoy it so much. Yeah, I think it's 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 less that I revert back to the practice sessions, but the practice sessions uh, get you used to dealing with being uncomfortable. You know, I think a trap that I'd fall into um, sometimes is like I wouldn't want to do my my short game drills until my short game felt good, or you know I wouldn't want to go play nine until I felt like I was hitting it good. And the uh, but the best thing to do is is to go out and do those that stuff and try and create it when you're feeling terrible, you know, because yeah, yeah. that's kind of what brings you out into a golf course. And like it's not like you can play six holes the final round and you feel uncomfortable with your putting and you you turn around to everyone and say hold on a sec I just need to go in for half an hour and do some work on my putt I'll be back <laughs> yeah. out when it feels good you know um, so I, I'm a big believer though when I when I do my practice games is just to try and keep doing my routine because mm-hmm. it's very easy like especially if you're doing like you know, the simple three foot four foot drill around the hole and you're trying to get 30 or 40 in a row or something it's easy to just keep keep dragging a ball and doing it until you get it but if you take your time with each one uh, I find that's much more transferable so um, but also that year was a build up like I'd been in that situation a few times before and it was it was a matter that I was very used to it you know because no matter how much you practice you can't simulate a situation of final few holes of a tournament those nerves um, like it's always going to be different but but you can definitely do things to stack the deck in your favour. Yeah, uh, yeah. It was a playoff with um, was it Eduardo Mol- Eduardo Molinari in Morocco? The start yeah, of the year. Yeah, he beat me in the first hole of the playoff. Yeah, that was in April. Yeah. And do you put do you put that, you know, that experience 
that that help you going towards then when you're in contention again in the British Masters? Yeah, because I I remember I was finishing and I thought I was going to have to par. I thought I'd have. I thought the only person in, that I was competing with the last two holes was Paul Waring. He was playing in front of me, and I was watching mm-hmm. him. So I knew I thought if I finished par par, I'd be in a playoff par birdie, I'd win. Um, and by the time I got down to the seventeenth green, Molinari had up to he birdied seventeen and eagled eighteen, and he'd gone from not even on the leaderboard to one ahead. So then all of a sudden I had to birdie the last to get into a playoff and that kind of just taught me that like enough was never enough you know so when I played I was definitely going back to that when I was playing the final round um, and I think I got I, I got off to a really good start on Sunday and I was three ahead through six um, and that, that was it then you know that was a reminder of three ahead is nothing it can go in the space of five minutes so just kind of keep the foot down and keep pressing obviously I was playing well um, mm. And I got breaks. You know, I think every time you like, look at anybody win, they always seem to get the break at the right time. And, you know, I got a couple of them. So, meant to be. Yeah, of course, yeah. And did you uh, you came, did you come second in the Spanish Open the same year? Or was that the year after? No, that was next year. Was that, and yeah. when, in, in that scenario, I'd love to know how you were thinking because I was watching it. Um, and I don't think you had your best stuff on the Sunday. But you still sort of were grinding around and making making scores, you know. What do you put that down to? Surely that can't be technical. There has to be something that you worked on over time to be able to do that. No, I've never watched that round back. I remember I remember the feeling I had after was that I didn't play that bad. I obviously didn't play as well as I had on... Because I remember Thursday I was... I might have been one over through six or something. I hadn't played an event in Europe in a couple of months and the I I had the cut line I mean through six holes on Thursday I had the cut line in my head. I was out late Thursday. <laughs> Don't know why. I <laughs> and uh and all of a sudden I rattled off a couple of birdies and I wasn't feeling like I was you know, it was only Thursday. I was just feeling like I was pushing further and further away from the cut line, which is great. And then I eagled eighteen and all of a sudden was leading. Um I think I shot 600 and went out the next morning. The great thing when you're playing well and you have late early tea time is you just, you get off the golf course, go to bed, wake up, and you're back on the golf course, you know, yeah, yeah. and you kind of continue. And I shot seven under, had a good lead. Um, but I, I think I shot one under on Sunday. I went out tied for the lead. But I didn't play as well as I played, but I played well enough. I failed to shoot five under. And... I just needed the putts to drop. I'd put it great all week and I felt like I put it well that day and nothing went in, that sort of thing. I couldn't get any momentum going. Um, like you say, things have to go right when you win. Like I remember John won that tournament and he hit it on the bank left of 17 with his tee shot. And you could go out there now and not a ball will stay up on that bank. <laughs> like every ball rolls in the water, you know. And he got up and down for par. And that's the difference because, I mean, you go down to the drop zone there you're making five, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it, it, I, I think I was comfortable with it at that stage where I knew I can I can play really really well in those situations, you know. Yeah. And I think that's the difference. It's like not trying to creep over the line, but realizing that if you want to win, you have to go out and you have to play a really good game of golf. When I think as an amateur, if I had a lead in a tournament, I just had to not fuck it up, really, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, you won the East of Ireland, didn't you? Standard. Yeah, there's a perfect example. I mean, I was, I won the East. That was a long time ago, 2013. I forget exactly the scores I shot, but it was like I got myself to a lead after two rounds, and it was just a matter of not shooting 76 and throwing yourself out of it. I think I might have shot a couple of 71s or 72s or something on the, in the final day. It was 36 holes. Yeah. But at that standard of golf, you very rarely have to run away with something, you know. Mm-hmm. And then as a, that was the difference when you when I stepped up to the pros. Like if you had, if you had a lead, you still had to play well to win. You know, it wasn't like you just hold on to it. So yeah, that's the I difference, know, I, I guess. People on the transition there, you know, from the open um, where you're leading after fifty-four holes as an amateur, what was your difference? 
granted it's the Open it's a major I know it's a huge difference between winning in the British Masters to the Open but how did you feel differently entering the Sunday from the Open to the British Masters? Oh, but, well they're two years apart where I learned a lot but I'd say the, the big difference is I stand by that if I played the Open on the Sunday I felt good I could have I could have won the Open that Sunday without a question, but just things would have had to go my way. But in terms of everything would have had to go my way. So, like, I needed the weather to be a certain place for me mentally to be in the right position to play. Because at the time, I was struggling when it was raining. Um, I was struggling and holding on to my right-hand grip. Um, and I was warming up for the final round, and I was, I'd warmed up well. Uh, I was nervous, obviously, but I was hitting the ball really solid on the range. And like, as I walk over to the chipping green about 20 minutes before I tee off, it starts raining. So that gets in my head, you know. And that was my last thought was, shit, it's raining. You know, I'm going to struggle out here. Rather than, um, if it had started raining three or four holes in, when I was off to a start and kind of in the momentum of the day, uh, I could have dealt with it a bit better. So that's the bit that threw me that day. But then that's just a bit of, for me, that was, uh, a lack of experience you know because the people who do really well on Sundays are, are the people that deal with everything really well because it's yeah. the most chaotic day you'll play you know there's so many ups and downs uh, like you're always exhausted after playing a Sunday in contention for the whole day um, because you, like your thoughts change every 30 seconds um, and the highs and lows come every 10 minutes so yeah uh, I on by the time I got to Bridge Masters, I think I was, I was ready to deal with anything, you know. So like when people started making a run, or if I hit a bad shot and hit, got myself in a little bit of trouble, it wasn't a big, it wasn't as big of a deal, you know. Mm -hmm. When back in St Andrews, it would have been more panic stations, um, especially if you play St Andrews when it was rain and I was struggling releasing my right hand, it kept slipping off the grip, so I'd I'd block it. Mm -hmm. And anyone who plays Sanders knows you don't want to go out feeling like you're hitting blocks. No, don't mind going out there hitting hooks. Yeah, just well. You play St. Andrews, just turn your right hand over, hit hooks all day, and you'll be fine. Yeah, I, I learned that the hard way the first time I played it. Oh, well. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> with, with, um, what did I want to say to you? There was, um, when you win in St. Andrews, you know, you're talking about you, you didn't deal with it well. How do you now, how do you prepare going forward to deal with, you know, when you're, when the shit's going to hit the fan and you're like, all right, I didn't expect this to happen. How do you deal with it now going forward, Dan, when you did in St. Andrews? I don't think, I, I, I don't have like a, a remedy. It's just like it's experience, you know? Yeah. So I've done it before. I've been there. And so when that sort of thing happens, you just take it in your stride better. You know, you, you learn to brush things off uh, and not dwell on them. and and I'll take things as they come. So I think I'm definitely afraid of losing a lot less now. You know, like I don't mind if I go out to a, a Sunday and lose um, as long as I give myself a chance to win. Yeah. You know, I want to I wanna be able to do everything I can to give myself the best chance to win. And if things don't go my way and I don't, it's fine. But I don't go out there afraid of not winning, you know. So your so, acceptance is a lot better. Exactly, yeah. You go out there and, like, I'm happier with the player that I am. So I, I don't feel like I need to prove anything to anybody, you know. Like, I go out there and... I go out there and I, I know what my game is and I just try and play the best round that I can. And if yeah. that means I lose by five or win by ten, you know. Five you did your after. Best. Yeah, exactly, exactly yeah. Um, and I think the other way I was chasing leaderboards a little bit too much and someone birdies the first two and like you're like oh, I'm two behind now I've got to make a push and you're like only the second you know yeah exactly yeah that was brilliant and how are you going to prepare now going forward how's the hand by the way yeah it's grand it's getting there bit by bit it's not uh, not fully there yet but we'll um, I don't know how long it'll be from now because it, it's it's hard to tell with the small bones in the hand and the way the circulation works or whatever it's hard to put a, a, a date on it but it's a lot better than it was a couple of months ago so it's just trying to get that final push to get back playing again 
are you hitting full shots? No, not yet. No, just trying to still work on the rehab, getting there to where I can um, get back practicing again. And then I guess the silver lining is there's no tournaments. So I'm not losing any ground. Yeah, fair point. Yeah. And how are you going to manage your sort of expectations when you come back? You know, I, I obviously you'd, in the long run, you'd like to be back up to the top. Um, how are you going to manage that you know, bit by bit going forward? Uh, I don't think my expectations have changed. I, I, whatever tournament is be my first tournament back, I'll be trying to prepare for it to try and give myself a chance to win. You know, um, mm-hmm. obviously that's the dream scenario: go out and win the first yeah. one. But uh, but I, I want to come back to it. Like I'd like to when I can get my game back in in shape to to go out there and try hit the ground running because I'll be mentally very refreshed. You know, I've had a long break um, and try and get ahead of everyone the only thing is when I when we all come back I won't be the only rusty one which is good <laughs> yeah fact I'm just on that uh, the last question I wanted to say to you or ask you was um, how do you prepare effectively like sort of a doomsday hypothetical you know like you have to win this tournament or you have to rep- you have to say a fact like win this tournament or else the world is going to end how do you prepare that tournament and how do you manage your mental intensity going into the tournament I would go the complete opposite, though. I would never have a tournament where I'd say the world would end if I don't do well. Yeah, just hypothetically. I would, yeah, but I would have, I would always have the mindset um, helps me play well that if you get in those really high pressure situations where you have to play well in a tournament, I would always have the outlook that, it's like, no matter what happens that week, your life isn't terrible. You know, like you always go back yeah. and you have your family and you have your friends and you have your 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 life. The people that care about you aren't going to hate you because you play bad, you know. <laughs> and that makes yeah. it easier then to see it as a game and mm-hmm. you go out and try and compete the best way you can. But like when it comes to, in the terms of preparation, like I would do a lot of competitive practice or like gr- trying like grinding practice if I was at home. Yeah. Um. And, you know, try and compete. If it's if I'm on my own, try and compete with myself. Like, give myself uh, a number of shots. I need to get up and down or something or, or else I have to go around the circuit again. Um, okay. But you find yourself going around it all day sometimes. Yeah. You have to find a balance of what's hard enough and what's too hard. <laughs> um, yeah, of course, yeah. And at tournaments, I would say it, it's a little bit less um, grinding practice because you have enough grind on the golf course and that practice is tiring, you know, and you need it when you're at home. But if you're, if you're doing that in the golf course all week for a few weeks in a row, you don't need to do it all the time off the golf course. Well, you need to get your head away from it, you know? So it's doing, it's finding what's and how much is enough to keep myself as sharp as I need to be. And then go off and completely mentally reset and get your mind in a good space. Yeah, that's it. Key. I think a lot of people make that mistake is they feel like they have to their sessions have to be intense all the time. Where whereas they don't. Yeah, and I definitely fall under that bracket, you know. Especially if I feel like I'm struggling, I could spend the whole day out there hitting balls, but you you end up too tired by the time you go to play again, you know. Yeah. So it's it's finding the right balance of what um it's it's yeah how how little can you do to be as ready as you can be you know that's a turn that's basically what a tournament week is and what what do you do outside of golf that that helps your mind relax like for some people watch netflix some people go to the gym go for a run go for a walk around the city or something or Mm -hmm. skype friends or family or whatever but it's just something else that gets your mind off um helps you reset and how would you how would you do effective practice then you don't have any sort of strict regimen as in like I want to hit 50 balls the correct way or how would you routine being the main one but how would you go into um, a good range session that's effective that you feel like you're going to get something out of it Jesus yeah, Christ I, start off- I need my I need my fucking haircut look at that yeah don't we all I'm not yeah, there with you yeah I'm going to have a mu- I'm going to have a mullet soon <laughs> the, uh- 18 weeks later <laughs> The, uh, I mean, I'd start off with a warm up. You know, it depends on you're trying to get out of the range session. You know, but there's a few different yeah. games you can play. Like the track man's good to try and hit different numbers. If you're trying to get creative, you can try hit the same number of five different clubs. It's always a good one. 
Oh, yeah. Um, so if you, you could pick like 137 and see, you have to hit land at 137 with five different clubs before you can leave. Kind of gets the creativity flowing. Not in a row. That would be you'd be there all day. <laughs> but you might hit a full wedge. You might go 137. Then you try to take a little off a nine. Um, work on some different shapes. You could make a little fairway down the the uh, the range and say you have to hit six out of nine shots landing in the fairway before you can leave. Make it fairly strict. Um, then the track man, you can get some wedge games going, try to get your numbers dialed in. Um, yeah. The only downside of the track man is it doesn't change targets. So it's easy to get in the, just a, put an alignment stick down, get a target you like, and just keep hitting shots down that. Um, Chances of getting the same shot in golf. Yeah, but even if it's not the same shot, even if it's, you know, they spit out a number at you, hit this one 82 yards and hit the next one 96. The, like, always on the range, there's one, like, when I step up on a range, my eye is drawn to one target. I like, I like to look at that one, you know. But generally, that's like I'm going to hit a good shot at that target. So I, I need to practice it also at the one that I feel uncomfortable aiming at, you know. Yeah, so yeah, I guess. It's yeah. easy to just throw an alignment stick down, set up the track man at the 150 marker that you like the look of, and you could hit every club through the bag straight over it. But if someone tells you, shift over to the left there and try to hit it in between the bushes and the 250. All of a sudden, you could feel uncomfortable aiming at that one, you know. But that's that's what you could get on one of the tee boxes out there. So, yeah. kind of mix and match and th- that sort of thing. And then there's there's definitely a play a time and a place for block practice. If you have a coach there and they they say you need to do a little bit of work on on something, you know, you can stand yeah. there for half an hour and just kind of repeat it over and over again and try and ingrain it. And then bring that to the sort of simulator practice. Yeah, but I mean, that takes time. It's very hard to, like, someone tells you something, you do it for half an hour, and then you're able to do it competitively. You know, it's it generally is a, a work in progress. But I think yeah. that's what needs to be seen as. You're not going to fix it in one day. Like, I get and I fall into the thing of, if I feel like something's working, I try and fix it that day. You know, when, like, you're better off just doing a bit that day and then doing a bit on the exact same thing the next day. And if you work on the same thing every day, over time it gets better but if you overwork on something one day then the next day you'll try to look for something else and then you'll end up picking and choosing different things i think you're better off just sticking with something and doing it over and over again yeah because then you're at risk of that rabbit hole as you're saying of trying to fix things all the time different things yeah and look golf is i think the most i think you're you're better off thinking you're doing the right thing than actually doing the right thing yeah, fact. You know, as long as you believe you're, what you're doing is right, then that's all that matters. Yeah, definitely play better golf. Um, anyway, absolutely, your gent. Thanks a lot for the for the chat. I learned so much from chatting to all you lads, especially you. I'd actually, who do I have on that? Do you know uh, Dave Allred? Yeah. Not well, a little bit. Yeah, I've seen him out there a few times. Jace, he's he's brutal when it comes to practice, as in. There's, there's no bullshit. It's absolutely oh, brilliant. Yeah. I've read his book, yeah. Fred, what, um, what do you think of it? It's very good, yeah. I took little bits of it and and and, and use it. I would have had a, a college coach that would have been very similar to that. Um, yeah. So he's still like, if, I, if I'm if i struggling with my practice, I call him and he sends me on some games to do. Um, yeah, yeah. But he would have been very similar and he would have, cha- he would have like changed the rules as you've gone along to try and fuck you over just yeah. love that to, yeah try, he basically was like any game he said if you play a game and you're not pissed off halfway through the game's not hard enough oh, I love that that's brilliant yeah <laughs> and now so do, he, do you get do you get pissed off though do you ever want to throw in the towel do you oh I never want to throw in the towel but I want to kill him <laughs> fair enough yeah yeah I can't blame yeah. you I was, I was in the same thing when uh, I, I, I had this conversation with so many people you know how does uh, when, when do you how, how do you not throw in the towel how do you not how do you keep going and I said I, I can revert back to it's not golf I can revert back to the first run I did and I tell them was, uh, I had to do 100 kilometers and I was 40 kilometers in and I, I was fucked I couldn't I couldn't move the longest I've ever run in my life and I had to do 60 more and Whatever I did, I, I managed to do it. So I said, "Why would I pack? Why would you be pack it in if you're struggling to hit a golf shot?" It's 
you, that's not a real issue. Just keep going until you get it, and you will get it. It might take time, but you'll get it, and then that's the best, most beneficial practice you can get out of it because you're, you're pissed yeah. off. Yeah, especially, yeah. and I think those, those sort of games, like you, I said, it's, it's, it's finding the balance of what's, what's very difficult to do but also what's not impossible. So, like, if he, he'll give us a game, you go to the chipping green and there might be five flags and you'll have a chip. And you have to chip five in a row inside a, a club length with five different clubs. Yeah. Really. So, it won't, be, it won't be that hard a chip, you know. But the first flag might be basic and you do your lob wedge, your cap wedge, pitch and wedge, nine iron, and then, like, maybe a bump and run with a three wood or something. You do it like this done mm-hmm. second flag might take you a little bit longer um, but then you'll get a flag that'll be on a slope yeah. and you'll be there for an hour and you'll be like I don't know if I can it's possible but then you realise you've done it with all the different clubs you just have to do it in a row um, that sort of thing um, it's that balance then, that's sort of a, a flow of practice you know you don't want to get the bore and you don't want to get the anxious you want to keep the flow going up and the difficulty down. yeah and like I wouldn't quit but I'd take a break you know if it got to, if you're a couple hours in and you're wrecked or you're just getting real frustrated you just sit down for 10 minutes you know mm-hmm. have a bit of food and then come back at it and try it again but um, but like also if you have a game where he says that you, need, you have to make 30 20 footers in a row you know, you that's wouldn't even try. You wouldn't. No, but you wouldn't even. That's not a game. You wouldn't. That's what I'm saying. You wouldn't even try. Yeah. It's just too hard. Like you know, it's too hard. No one's gonna do it. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. like he give that to you, and you're you wouldn't even give it the attention because you'd be like, that's useless. So he, that's what he says. He sends me on the games that he he tries out with his college team now, and he he kind of finds out the ones that are are too easy, too hard, somewhere in between, and sends them on. Yeah, I've seen I've seen a good one that uh, Cameron McCormick does. It's with Hold on, God, sorry, yeah, someone's ringing me. I've seen a, a one that uh, Cameron McCormick did with Jordan Speed. It was like sort of a thing called the wedge works. You got to flight your wedge, you got to hit a low wedge inside six feet, you got to, or whatever your number they picked, a, a mid wedge inside the same, then a high wedge inside the same. And once you did those three, you got to move it back to a different yardage, different target. So you're just changing your trajectory and you're um, trying to hit them all into the side of the same square. I thought it was a brilliant one, and it's um. He said he got very anxious and very pissed off at it, but once he achieved it, he felt really comfortable hitting different shots going onto the golf course that you would face. Yeah, and that sort of thing is good because, like, it's the same with that chipping game. If if you have to hit a sixty foot bump and run with a, an eight iron inside a club length to complete it, it's like that's a simulating an environment where you're nervous because you want to finish and you don't want to start again and you're a bit pissed off, but you have to hit a great shot to finish. It's mm-hmm. not like you can just sneak in a three footer. It's like if to hit a sixty foot bump and run inside a club length is a really good shot, you know. Yeah. Or to hit a high wedge from sixty five yards inside six feet, you know. So like under the gun you have to pull off a really good shot to finish. And that's what a tournament is, you know. Mm-hmm.